show 959. So he's got more and more coming in. I'm scrolling through the the folks that are here, the names, a lot of familiar names. All right. Well, on my clock, it's 10 o'clock, or yeah, it's 10 on the dot. So I'll start us off. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Zach Gaston. I work for Edos Miller. I do, or I'm responsible for our custom projects, custom products, uh, marketing, contracts, all that kind of stuff. And I'm here with my co host, Ken Miller, who is our CEO and co founder. So, welcome. Yeah. We both have enough hats, right? Like, you know, <laughs> one day we'll have a business that's big enough that we don't, you know, have to wear so many hats, but I'm not sure that I really believe that when I say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine the day, but hopefully one day that, that comes. So yeah. um, everyone, we, we were inspired uh, to compile um, information for this webinar for you. Um, it's the state of upstream MWD for 2021 and beyond. I think that we're going to bring a unique perspective for you guys because um, at this point, from our product standpoint with Micropulse and Eclipse Touch, uh, we have over 35 unique customers. Uh, so we have all of their voices taken in. And then we have our technology partners for the various custom projects and products that we work on. Um, and so, as you know, um, many of you here, I see the names are service providers or MWD directional. And it, as you probably know already, the drilling engineers, geologists, operators that you guys work with specifically have their own cares. Um, the, th the features, the stuff that they care about the most, maybe it's safety, maybe it's reliability, maybe it's high temp, maybe it's, um, you know, any number of things. But what we've done is taken all those conversations that we have with all of you, compiled them, and we have a list of technologies that seem to be recurring uh, through those conversations. And so uh, you might know of some of these technologies already, or at least I hope you do for the near term ones. And then we have technologies that are coming in the future. Um, and so um, what we've done is taken that list of uh, technologies from our own conversations, but also added in from the feedback. Um, some people on our sign up filled out some technologies that did overlap with some conversations with operators and drilling engineers. And so we wanted to add those into the presentation today. And so what we've done is combine those topics into three different categories. We've got what's coming in 2021, uh, all the stuff that's near term. If you haven't heard of it before, it might be too late. Uh, we've got our Second section, which are things that we're not yet working on ourselves. Um, so we might need someone to help carry that torch or maybe partner with us to get those things across the finish line. And then lastly, we've got uh, things that we think are coming in the long term. So 2022 and beyond stuff that we need to lay the foundation for now, if we want to have those things actually come to fruition then. Now, after my lengthy introduction, Ken, are you ready to go? Always. I am always 100% ready. 110%, 100,000%, you know. Well, let's start with the 2021 topics that are coming this year. So the first topic I have is azimuthal gamma, which in my opinion has nothing to do with azimuth. So yes. why the heck is it important? No, I mean, we've talked about that and that's the big joke. It really should be called like a tool face gamma or something, you know. Anyways, um, it's critical for more advanced geosteering, right? Like if we really want to increase the amount of wells that we drill that produce well, uh, and not just drill a bunch of holes as fast as we can, setting records and not really care about their oil output, then we really want to be geosteering more and more often, right? And so a number of things are all coming into place. Um, you know, one, the tools are becoming, you know, more low cost and more miniaturized, right? And azimuthal gamma is something that's really you know, near and dear to my heart because one, people told us it couldn't be done, right? You couldn't, you know, there's no way that you can build a tool that's, that's retrievable, that's small, that's cost-effective, that can be as a gamma. It's got to be a big collar thing with, 
you know, three or four crystals on the outside because that's how the majors did it. And that's the only way that you can do it, right? You can't do it in the probe. And I think at this point, 2020, 2020 and 2020 with 21, we've unequivocally proven that wrong, right? So we've, we've actually done several jobs now with as a gamma in a retrievable tool, sending up, you know, beautiful images, eight sector, you know, compressed or better, uh, real time and people, you know, love the images and they're, they're doing great geo steering with it, right? And so I, I see now that that LWD technology has been miniaturized, right, and made cost effective to where it can be part of a standard tool, I see that the use of that going up and up and up, right? So the, the tools have, have really gotten where they need to be as far as being ruggedized and miniaturized for the U.S. market. Uh, on top of the fact that everybody has uh, really good data flows for working with the Azigamma data, right? I mean, you hand somebody an Azigamma sensor 10 years ago and it's like, okay, what do you do with it, right? Like if you don't have Schlumberger's internal software or whatever, you can't, or Pathfinders or whatever, it's hard to do anything with it, right? But there are so many good data platforms now, like uh, I know the guys at Rogi are doing a really good job with Starsteer and other programs like that, that it's really easy to incorporate advanced LBD measurements into uh, your your overall well program and your overall well construction routine than it used to be right and so those things are all coming in place to where I think that every single you know quarter from here on out you're going to see an increase in the in, in the amount of wells that are you know drilled with a NWD equipped with an ansible gamma measurement yeah I agree I mean a, a lot of it of course we all work with operators so a lot of it has to do with the cost aspect that you hit on a little bit um, bringing it to be less of a full MWD or excuse me, LWD tool down into something that you can just run in your regular MWD string. Well, that was I, quite important. I think, I think we're all we're familiar with the challenges of the U.S. market now, but you know, it's very difficult to take an offshore tool and make it work in the U.S. market because two things, one cost and two reliability, right? And so to really deliver to the U.S., you have to have way lower cost and it has to be way more reliable uh, because the, the drilling is just so fast and aggressive, right? And so those are two things that make it very difficult to to bring it, to mature and bring a technology to these fields. Right. Um, so that's our first technology. Um, that's the first one that I think if if you haven't interacted with Azigamma, at least the, the lower cost solutions that are out there, um, make sure to start investigating getting that into your fleet. Um, the second the second I, topic that we have. Hmm? I, in 2021, I should just say that there's, there's no, there should be no NWD company that as a gamma measurement should be beyond, right? It's, it, it's now to the point where anyone can pick it up and run it. Yeah. Um, so our, our second topic is one that's been getting hotter and hotter by the day, and that's uh, Haynesville and the high temperature market. Um, so this is a request I, almost every single person has asked for uh, uh, recently. <laughs> Yes. Uh, have we talked about anything besides hot hole tools in the last six weeks? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So no, I mean, there's this there's this massive push to get into to hotter and hotter wells. I think you know, 2017, 18, we were all okay with you know running lower temp tools that maybe had some more advanced features in the Permian and elsewhere, wherever we can get away with it because, hey, we need the more advanced features. But there's a ton of it that's turning around and going back to the the you know hot hole. Uh, we're Hainesville, South Texas, et cetera, and everybody's saying, okay, can you build me a, a 185C sensor? Can you build me a 200-degree C sensor? The, the demand right now is, is just enormous, right? And I, I think this is, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of people are aware, but uh, that's also driven by the fact that, uh, you know, Weatherford has pulled out of the uh, U.S. market. I, I know they had some really fantastic high-temp tools that are now no longer available in this market, which left a pretty big market void for everybody to come in there and do that, right? And so it's it's a really big challenge. I mean, the sensor is one thing, but to get your entire tool up to that, you know, 185C, true 185C or 200 degree C rating is, it's not straightforward. It's a big challenge. You know, obviously we're focused on, on the sensor aspect of that, but it's, it's going to be interesting, right? And, you know, the, the thing that I, you know, would caution everyone against here is, uh, you know, keep in mind that there's only so many rigs in the Haynesville, right? We, we, we're talking to everyone right now about trying to get into the Haynesville and there's only so many rigs. And so, you know, just uh, be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I want to ask the question because it's a personal question of mine, but what needs to be done to get a 185C full tool done? Like, is it mechanical stuff? Is it just the sensors? I mean, what's left? 185C is where the ground and physics like really starts to push you and test you. Like, 
it's, um, you know, 175C is difficult. 185C is, is logarithmically harder, right? And then 200C is even, even getting there, right? So, I mean, there are, you know, first you have to have the raw elements available, right? Can I get an accelerometer or do I have to build one? Can I get a, a, a microcontroller or do I have to build one? Can I get a power supply, right? All those raw elements there are there for 185C. But, you know, you and I both know that it's, it's not just about having those building blocks. It's about actually, you know, building them all into a tool and producing them, right? And when you get into reliable operation at 185C, everything has to be perfect, right? Like things that, things that you may have been able to get away with as far as like solders or, you know, uh, low level board manufacturing issues that you may, have, you may have never even seen at 150C or 175C. You know, you could have an issue that, you know, when you go out and you drill a well at, you know, entire lifetime of an electronics module at 150C, six, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 6,000 hours, whatever, would have been fine. And then you take that up to 185C and it craters in 10 minutes, right? Like it's just, it's just absolutely punishing from a materials perspective, right? And so to really go out and compete in that market, I mean, you have to have the right building blocks. You know, you have to have the right design because it already these designs are even more expensive. And then you're, you, you have to be on point on your manufacturing game. Like you have to get everything consistently manufactured perfectly or you're going to have a really difficult time, right? And uh, I mean, this, this is a big challenge for the entirety of the tool because, you know, if I'm thinking just from a circuit board sensor perspective, right? I mean, okay, I mean, I, 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 that's a sensor. That's nice. But I still got to get my hot hole batteries. I still got to have hot hole connectors. I've got to have, you know, hot hole pulsers. So getting a motor uh, or a solenoid or something to operate at that temperature. And then there's even bigger challenges with the elastomers, right? And sealing everything up and making sure that that, that works. And so, I mean, it is just, it's a, it's a big battle and it's an exciting one. It's a really fun one to tackle. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how some people solve this problem, but it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. The, I mean, I know the allure is the, the higher day rates, but the, the thing people don't tell you about is that those tools do not last nearly as long. You're basically running them a couple of times, toss them in the trash and starting over. So it's, you know, it, the, the full financial picture might not be the same as, as advertised. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that, I think right, right now, the few companies that can do it or maybe enjoying a little bit of a little bit of pricing reprieve because they can, you know, feel the hotter hole tool where, where not everyone can, right? I, th I think it's pretty approachable for most companies to go out and drill in the Permian, right? But the Haynesville is, you know, kind of limited to certain providers right now that can, they can actually feel the hot hole tool. And obviously that's getting more competitive as well. But yeah, I mean, you, you burn through tools fast, right? I mean, there's, you know, 200 hours, 300, 500 hours, you're doing really well, right? Like it's, it's difficult to keep a tool without having to just completely rebuild it, you know, going that long, right? And so, um, oh, I see a, a, a question here in the chat that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and address. Do I think some sort of downhole cooling will be required to routinely, routinely operate above 200 degrees Celsius? Um, huh. Good question. Um, it would certainly make it easier, you know, if we could come up with, with a really good one. I mean, Peltier blocks and stuff like that, they're just not going to work. They're way too power hungry. You, you'd introduce a turbine, it would make everything crazy. The most intriguing technology that I've seen is some like liquid cool, like, like chemical liquid cooling, where you have like a reservoir of, you know, uh, reactants and stuff like that, that, that end up, you know, combining throughout the run and you have kind of a limited fuel supply that, that uh, cools everything. That could be pretty darn practical depending on the price of all those uh, chemicals, but um, it really just depends, right? Um, okay, Baker, you, are you, are you, Carl, I assume you're talking about the, the, uh, the, li the liquid cooling, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that I think is pretty interesting, but um, you know, I mean, I think there's also a, a strong case for just taking the static approach as well and just building something that can handle the temperature. You know, there is um, a really, um, uh, there, there are some big advances coming through on the semiconductor side. You know, there are now microcontrollers that you can go get off the shelf. that are rated for 300 degrees Celsius. Right. And so there are a lot of applications for aeronautics, mostly on the defense side uh, that are pushing temperatures, like trying to get processing and all sorts of stuff really close to jet engines and extreme temperatures that are, are, are seeing some cool stuff there. And then um, there's also a really interesting uh, silic semiconductor material called silicon carbide, which I think holds a lot of really interesting untapped potential for this industry in which you can, you know, manufacture semiconductors, photodiodes, these kind of things with a material that, that by nature handles, you know, 180 or 200 degrees Celsius and not, not much higher, right? Um, yeah. 
Ken, I'll have to save. I'm yeah. watching the questions on the side. I'm going to have to save some of them so we get through our topic. Yeah, we could talk about them all day, right? So, um, the, the next one I have, hopefully, just about every single person on this call has heard of. Um, it, it is continuous surveys. Um, and more specifically, uh, getting the accuracy of the continuous surveys to be something that may, be, may become a standard so that we're not having to stop for surveys. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, uh, look, I mean, continuous ink, like if you, if you don't have that down by now, you're, you're in trouble, right? Like that's, like that's just an expected given on any well uh, in the U.S. And then uh, continuous azimuth, like this year, last year, actually 2020, we saw a lot of the continuous azimuth measurements from the independents become very mature and very good to where that's going to now start becoming expected. You know, um, you know, the operators are already saying, ah, we're, we're used to having continuous ink and azimuth. You can't upcharge that anymore, right? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, you know, the next step here is really um, going beyond just basic trending. I mean, right now, continuous sync and as are, are, are extremely valuable for just trending and seeing how you're drifting in and out of where you're trying to drill, you know, minimizing sliding, you know, minimizing uh, NPT, this kind of stuff, right? But, and I mean, and, it, and it's deliverable in every single tool, right? Because like, you know, with our, with our directional modules, we have a fantastic continuous azimuth and we don't require any sort of uh, complicated uh, anti-rotation mechanisms like you'd see maybe in, in like some of the bigger RSS tools or something like that where they kind of counter rotate the directional module to keep it static. I mean, we've been able to tackle that and handle, uh, you know, calculating continuous azimuth while the DM is rotating, while it's vibrating, while everything's flying around down there. And uh, the next real step is, you know, you know, giving that, giving those measurements to the corrections guys so they can truly use them like a six axis, right? So setting up a synthetic correctable six axis on the fly is going to be a big challenge. Um, and then also, um, uh, yeah, at some point, I, I don't know that we're going, you know, right now we still really value this, the survey measurements, the static survey measurements at the connection time over those uh, continuous measurements. But I, I think that's going to be only for a limited amount of time. Um, you know, there's uh, some interesting inspiration here going back to World War II, which is the concept of dithering, which is one of my favorite stories to talk about. And, um, you know, they discovered dithering uh, when they were building bombers in the Second World War, because these bombers had mechanical uh, trajectory calculators for calculating how to, you know, when to drop the bomb, what the arc was going to be, how it was going to hit, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and... Um, what the engineers who built these mechanical calculators noticed is that is that the surprisingly and non obviously the calculators would work better in flight than they would on the ground and they'd be more accurate in flight and they, they started to investigate and they were like okay this is really curious this really shouldn't be you know we have the perfect situation here on the ground and then you have it the calculator up in the bomber flying, vibrating, banking left and right. Why is it working better up there than it is in a controlled environment? That makes no sense, right? And so what they figured out is, is, is really getting, diving into this, is that the mechanical vibration of like the engines and everything else, it eliminated the slop and the stick in the gears, right? And so that continuous vibration actually helped those mechanical gearing systems to operate a lot more consistently, right? And so there might be a similar argument to say that ultimately because of the fact that we're rotating, because of the fact that we're getting this average picture of the well bore, that continuous surveys may ultimately be a better source of survey information than static when you may be lying on the borehole in a weird way or whatever else, right? And so, or at least equal, there's a good case to be made there, right? And so um, I think that that's gonna continue to be kind of a technological battleground as people try and get even more value out of the, the continuous survey measurements. and. Um, and I, I really look forward to it. But I mean, you know, the next step is, you know, synthetic six axis on the fly all the time, compress the crap out of it, you know, correctable and, you know, oh, you didn't get your survey connection, who cares? We'll get a continuous survey really soon and we'll be fine, right? Um, so I, I, I am gonna answer this one question. Maybe I'll do one question for each section and then we'll save the rest for the end, right? Uh, Raymond says, if we, what, if, if we have high quality continuous surveys, how, are the, or how or will the government agencies be able to use them? Uh, I'm not sure that they're going to care. I mean, if we say it's a survey, it's a survey, it's a survey. So, I mean, if we're, if we're confident that it's the survey and it's a good quality survey, uh, what's the difference, right? I mean, uh, you know, we're already, so the industry is already submitting, uh, you know, interpolated surveys in certain cases to the state, right? The guys at Superior QC have come up with a really cool algorithm that's able to interpolate survey report, survey stations every 15 feet between 90 foot surveys, right? And so, 
uh, that's a really interesting mechanism that does a good job minimizing TBD error in, this, in, in kind of the Stockhausen effect. And they are already submitting those synthetic surveys to the state. Um, and so I'd say there's precedent there that, you know, beyond just static surveys, that the state's going to say, okay, well, if you, if you trust it and you're willing to put your reputation on the line for this, the quality of this survey, then we'll accept it, right? And I think that's kind of the biggest thing there. Uh, Ken, the next topic I've got is telemetry compression. This one, this one has been gaining some steam over the last six months for sure. Right. Yeah. So this, this is a fun one. Uh, telemetry compression is, I think, also going to be a big technology battleground as well. Um, you know, we're coming out of the age or, you know, we, 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 the dawn of fast pulse, right? Like in 2017, 2018, everyone's like, okay, fast pulse, fast pulse, fast, fast pulse, right? We figured out, okay, you know what? If we run a mud pulser at 0 0.375, 0 0.25, whatever, we actually can decode that signal, 0.15 if we're crazy. Um, we're able to make big enough pulses. We can see it on surface. We've got, you know, the, the filter is set up now to where we can, we can decode it. And, um, hell, let's go, let's go really fast, right? EM's dead because we can pulse at a 0.15, right? Or a 0.25. Why even bother with EM systems anymore? And, um, I, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, maybe a hangover from that because a lot of people are saying, okay, well, I made my data 50 or hundred percent faster by, by cranking up the, 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 the pulse width or cranking down the pulse width, however you want to say it. And so I'm eating my batteries faster. I'm eating my pulser faster. I'm eating my lower end faster. You know, I'm really just right. turning up the amplitude. I'm using more power to do that. And I'm, I'm providing data to my customer faster, but are they, are they valuing that at, 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 a, at, at a proportionate value to, you know, what it's costing me. Right. And I think that maybe what we're seeing is that it's a bit out of whack, right? I can, I can run at a 0.15 for the customer and they can get, they have a, a marginal enjoyment of additional data, right? Like I, I get them twice the amount of data and they see that as like, I don't know, 5% better, 10% better, but it's costing me double on what it, what I used to, to service pulsers and lower ends and batteries and everything else. So, you know, the amount of, amount of value that I'm providing to the customer by just going faster, by doing the same old thing, just turning up the dial, uh, isn't really, isn't really working out economically, right? So there's a huge push right now to you know, use the same pulse widths that we've already kind of proven to be economical and get more data up on those pulse widths. And the good, the good news is that we can, right? Um, this, this data is all compressible. Um, you know, you have to get a bit more clever than just like zipping it all up, right? I mean, if you're willing to wait till the end of the well, we can zip it all up and send it all up in one big burst, but this is measurement while drilling and not measurement after drilling. And so you have to get pretty clever with how you compress it. And so, um, you know, compression is always about, you know, realizing or knowing something about your data set and then abusing that information, right? Um, or using that information to your advantage. And so, um, you know, we've already shipped, um, uh, on our platforms, we've already shipped compression for uh, the continuous uh, azimuth and inclination data. So we're able to double the amount of points that customers are getting. And then we're also, uh, we've also shipped uh, compressed continuous, uh, sorry, azimuthal gamma data, right? And so, you know, there were jobs with customers like, no, if you can't, if you can't give us eight sector as a gamma data, like, you know, compressed in this amount of time, like we're not going to give you the work. Like a four sector as a gamma uncompressed is not worth it to us. We have to have this compressed data. And so, um, you know, the good news is every, everything's compressible, right? There's, there's not a single variable on the NB that can't ultimately be compressed. And so, you know, even for those, you know, uh, for running at a, a 0.5 pulse width, right? Like, you know, right now that's one bit per second. That can easily be extended with compression, uh, to two or maybe even three bits per second at that pulse rate. And the good news is it's all scalable, right? So if you still want to run at that 0.15, you know, um, we're, you're going to be looking at six or seven bits per second, right? So, you know, I, I put my long bet up on longbets.org. You can, guys can go check that out. Uh, I've, I've made a bet publicly that by 2030 that um, more than half of rigs, NWD, will be running 10 bits per second regularly, right? And, like, I, I maybe I was, like, you know uh, – sandbagging way too much because I, I feel like maybe we're going to achieve that by 2022 or 2023 now but i feel more and more confident in that bet every single day um you know slumberger theorized that the ultimate bandwidth of the mud pulse channel is something like 40 bits per second right and um and that's interesting it's actually they actually theorized that the mud pulse channel is ultimately potentially faster than the em channel which they theorized to be about 20 bits per second ultimate possible you know, in, in, a, in a technical paper they published. And, you know, with my own work, I think those numbers are right in line. I mean, I think you could probably push it to 50 bits per second or something like that. 
but um, I, I think we're going to be approaching that quickly in the new competitive environment, right? And um, and so I, I look forward to to really cranking up the dial on speed. But that's I mean we still have to realize that that you know unless somebody figures out how to make an economical wired pipe, we're still going to have an, a very antiquated link to the downhole side, which is going to have all sorts of drilling automation implications, right? So okay, I've talked about right. that one way too much. <laughs> well, speaking of Schlumberger. Um, this next topic does have to do with him. Uh, we've heard Babblefish about 15 different times. Um, short hops in general as a technology. Um, why, why the heck are people wanting to hook up to Babblefish? I mean, like, this one's a newer one for me. So what's going um, on there? Basic application uh, for the simplest thing with the short hop is, is downlink confirmation, right? It's, it's mechanically bolting all these systems together, like trying to take a system designed by guy A and guy B and bolt them together physically with a connector is a nightmare. Like unless you have all that control under, you know, control in your own house and your Halliburton Sperry and you can design your own, you know, NWD, LWD stack that all bolts together with your big one wire connectors, you know, because you designed the whole thing in house, like trying to get multiple, you know, mechanical systems to bolt together from different manufacturers is a nightmare, right? It's, mu it's actually much easier to go wireless, right? And so that's, that's all a short hop is, is just a simple kind of wireless link um, at the BHA. And so, you know, wirelessly coupling the, the NWD to the rotary steerable has huge advantages, right? And the big one is downlink confirmation. Uh, so if you, you know, if, if you have a rotary steerable, most of them have an inclination or an azimuth hold or something like that. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, you downlink to it, you say, I want you to hold an inclination of 91 degrees, right? Well, unless you have it connected into the NWD to where it can say, yes, sir, I understood 91 degrees, then your only real choice is to drill, I don't know, 15, 30 feet and say, okay, was that at 91 degrees? Nope, right. we screwed up the downlink, right? So we just drilled a whole bunch of footage we're going to now have to correct, right? And so there's just huge value there in just downlink confirmation, right? But, um, you know, the short hops, you know, connecting into an RSS is a great initial application, but really perfecting this short hop technology to me is, is the beginning of the work towards a, a full end game, which is uh, really having an interconnected BHA, right? I, I believe that, you know, I, I've started to think about the NWD as kind of like the iPhone of downhole, right? Because it has a, a way to talk really far, a long range radio, and it has a way to talk really short, right? Like a short range radio, right? And on your cell phone, you could think of that as, you know, your, your connection back to the cell tower with the long range radio and the connection to all your peripherals like your your Beats or your AirPods or your car stereo or your, you know, uh, watch or whatever on the Bluetooth, right? All the little local communications, right? And so you can think of short hop technology as similar to Bluetooth and NBD telemetry is similar to like a cell radio, right? And that makes the, 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 the NBD kind of the iPhone kind of the hub, right? And so I am, am definitely championing and pushing towards this future where, you know, uh, you, you can bring in a RSS, a smart motor, an NWD, smart agitator, smart drilling dynamics units. We've got an open or at least known and shared wireless protocol and everybody's stuff just talks and just works when you put it all together in the BHA. And we have this smart interconnected multi-manufacturer BHA that just kicks ass. I mean, they're just, I mean, imagine if you could, you could wirelessly turn an agitator on and off by the second based upon what you wanted to do, right? Um, you know, there's just, the applications just start to get crazy. Um, and so there, I'm, I'm really excited about the short hop technologies for sure. Yeah, so you, we're talking about short hops near term is integrating with rotary steerables, but then longer term is this broader vision of using it to connect everything down hold. But to me, that leads me to my next section um, for our presentation, which is, um, stuff that needs to get started. And um, this is not to say that someone out there isn't working on these items, but this is stuff that uh, Erdos Miller, or at least to our knowledge, our partners are not working on. And so these are uh, technology ideas that need someone to carry the torch. Um, and maybe they already are, like I say, full disclosure, I don't know everything. Um, so let's jump into this section, Ken. Um, first one is low cost LWD. Um, I think this is, uh, well, first off, we've been asked because um, azimuthal gamma used to be thought of as an LWD tool, and now you get yourself a shielded gamma, you get yourself one of the, the uh, DMs or uh, micropoles, and all of a sudden you can run azimuthal gamma on, on the low cost. So 
how do we start turning these LWD tools into more low cost, more reasonable so that you are running them while you're drilling? Oh, are we, talk uh, are we talking about LWD or are we talking about the low cost rotor steer bolt? Low cost LWD. Okay, that one first. Um, look, I, I think there's a pattern that needs to be continued forward that we started with Azigamma, right? And so, you know, well, once again, people said you couldn't really uh, take a big LWD color mounted Azigamma and turn it into a low cost, reliable, retrievable tool. And we proved them wrong there. And so I think, you know, resistivity is probably the next natural one up to the challenge, right? How do we make a low cost, effective, you know, 80%, give me an 80%, you know, uh, resistivity that gives you 80% of what you get with a 10x more expensive tool in a retrievable form factor, right? So that we can bolt it onto every single NWD and cost effectively bring resistivity, right? Um, I don't know what Cordax is, but I'm, I'm assuming that's a pitch for somebody's it, <laughs> company. <laughs> it could be. It <laughs> but could be. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then you kind of just kind of continue on going on up the line, right? And there's been a lot of really cool stuff done with uh, ultrasonic kind of caliper on the fly tools. Um, you know, I, I've heard of some interesting stuff. You know, I, I, I really wonder what happened to that uh, through bit stuff. That was pretty interesting where they actually had the LWD tools pop out of the end of the bit and, and log. And there's, there, I've seen a lot of cool applications now where people are kind of doing LWD while tripping to where you have like a more, a more cost effective or advanced LWD tool that kind of logs all the data on the way out of the hole or something. But I mean, really the next one up on, on the docket is, is resistivity, right? And so how do you build a low cost resistivity that can, that can really, you know, bring resistivity to 50% plus of the, the U.S. shales? I mean, resistivity right now is few and far between because people only really call it out for the job when they need it. But we could do a so much better job if we could bring down bring up the cost effectiveness of that measurement, right? And so I think that that's gonna be a big engineering challenge of the next five years is to miniature, continue, continue miniaturizing the LOBD roadmap and continue perfecting that, right? There we go, user has told us that Cordax uh, is working on or has a pro base triple Very component. cool, see? So there you yeah. go. So someone out there is carrying that torch. Yeah, I'll have to look uh, that up. Something. Yeah, all the folks that, uh, submitted this, here you go. Like there's your answer here in the chat as to one option for that. Um, the next one, Ken, you already gave us a slight preview of, which is low cost rotary steerable systems. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, rotary- Why did rotary it have to be low cost? Well, I mean, rotary steerables are a disruptive technology, right? So you, you gotta remember that like, when they came out, I mean, they really fit that, that mold and that definition of disruptive technology. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy new thing. It starts off as, you know, usually either much more expensive or much cheaper than the previous one. In this case, much more expensive, but it has some crazy capabilities, right? And ever since their introduction, you know, year by year by year by year by year, consistently rotary steerable footage is going up, right? And so I think we're at a phase now where, you know, the rotary steerable concept has been proven. You know, uh, it's, it's drilled a, a ton of wells. There's some really big monsters out there like the, the Baker tool and the Slumberjay tool that just get the job done, but they're, they're high dollar tools. They took stupid, ridiculous amounts of engineering dollars to, to get to commerciality. Um, and I think it's time where that, that platform kind of gets, you know, democratized or commoditized or, you know, just made much more efficiently. Right. And so, I mean, my, my magic formula is that I'm looking for is a, is a, is a, is a every day, you know, 80%, 90% of your jobs, rotary steerable, that does what does, does what you want that has, that has inclination and can, in azimuthal gamma built in. I, I can't be more sure about that last point. Like, like if we go and do that, like either your RSS bit will be really damn short so I can put the NBD right behind it, or you gotta put those measurements in, the, in, the, in there and short hop them back to me. Like if, you, if you're not putting those measurements in there, we're wasting our time, right? And so, um, and uh, yeah, I, there, I know there's a ton of groups working on it. You know, uh, I, I think I saw some of the guys from Kinetic, they've got some really cool stuff coming. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Mr. Kramer up in, in Canada, Sparrow Technologies has a really cool low cost rotary steerable. And, and that, that's just two out of like probably 10 people that are working on this, right? And so this one definitely fits the bill of, you know, we know it's an issue or something the industry needs to tackle. We know there's a lot of people already working on it, right? So the question is, okay, who's gonna get there first, right? It doesn't really quite, really quite fit the category of hasn't been started yet. Uh, but it's going to be really cool, right? And I, I really look forward to it. I mean, and, it, and even then, Slumberjay is still really challenging the industry. The Nero steer, uh, you know, the, the steering with it's got the bit and the RSS and everything built in. That's a cool tool. That's really awesome, you know. I was blown away that, you know, I would never have thought to combine the bit and the, and the RSS together. That's just crazy. But, um, but yeah, I, I think ultimately that's where the industry needs to go. Um, and, um, 
it's going to be exciting. And I, I look forward to seeing who wins that race. I'm a little too late to join it myself. Yeah, exactly. But that's one we're going to have to watch from the outside. Um, what about this next topic? Um, downhill condition monitoring. Yeah, so there has been just a massive wave of technologies and improvements that have been made in the world of non-drilling equipment for condition monitoring, right? Uh, Amazon actually just came out with these super little cost-effective devices to where you can just slap them on whatever your piece of equipment is. And I guess we all call it surface equipment because it doesn't go down hole. But in reality, like very few things that are ever designed in this world go down hole and most things are surface equipment. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, you know, they, 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 they really uh, commoditized it now because you can just get these little vibration and temperature loggers that you just slap on any piece of hardware at the surface you want and it, it monitors for condition anomalies and all that kind of stuff. I think they got it cheap enough now, like, where if you want to do condition monitoring on your washing machine, that's cool. You can just buy one and slap it on your washing machine and it can watch out and see if the bowl starts vibrating differently, right? And so, um, and that, that wave has been incredibly effective and there's, there, there are so many more pieces of, of equipment that are, are being better designed for it and, in, and lasting longer because we're detecting these kind of anomalies, right? And so um, kind of directly transplanting that technology in my mind has failed because, and this is a fun little joke I like to say, we don't have rotating equipment. We have equipment that is rotated. And there's a big difference, right? And so I can't just slap an accelerometer on an NWD and look for an anomaly because, I mean, it's technically a static tool. Like it's technically a, a tool that doesn't rotate in and of itself, right? And if it had a rotating motor, I could look for anomalies in that, like a washing machine or a centrifuge or a, a you know, a, a GE power plant or something like that. But when the right. entire piece of equipment is, itself is being rotated, what the hell do you do, right? And so um, I think... Um, Really, we have to have a new approach, right? And it, it's really going to start with thinking about the best way to do condition monitoring for downhole tools. And I think that if we nail this problem, there's a, a solid chance that we can probably make a double digit increase into the effectiveness of every single downhole tool on the planet, right? I think that, you know, whether or not it's a bit or a motor or a, a rotary steerable or an NBD or a jar or whatever, right? I think every single one of these things can be uh, ultimately condition monitor, right? I think it's possible to build a, a, a smart system with ML that, um, you know, machine learning for short, that looks at all sorts of surface data, that looks at, you know, just a massive amount of downhole data. I think we can do intelligent by the second uh, monitoring of every serialized part and every piece of equipment. Look, this is not beyond our technological capabilities. And I think it has a, a, a massive chance of of really being worth the while and in, impacting the overall reliability of these systems, right? What's, what continues to scare me about US technology is we're already able to produce so much goddamn oil, excuse my French, and like we really haven't even started with technology yet. You know, I, I, used, to, I used to have this mindset that like, oh, you know what, it's, I'm, I'm, you know, it's 2010s, it's the 2020s, you know, everything that's been invented is cool and I'm just, I've already been invented and I'm copying old stuff. And I've, I've actually kind of, entirely convinced myself that nothing cool has actually been invented yet, right? And so I, I think this is kind of falls in that bucket is there's a ton of headroom there, right? And I, I'm talking about, you know, taking data from every single smart piece of equipment in the BHA and, and, and analyzing and applying that data down to the second to every single serialized component in the BHA across all tools, all manufacturers, right? There is a, a massive amount of headroom for what can be grabbed and improved there. And it's going to be really interesting. It is definitely a, a big, big, big data problem, right? I mean, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, for the longest time, you know, the amount of memory that you would produce from a downhole run is, was none, right? And then we introduced NBD tools and other things like that. And now we're talking about 10, 15, 50 megabytes of data being produced per downhole run. You know, our new NBD platform is going to be producing a gigabyte of data per downhole run a gigabyte, right. right? And then uh, on top of that, like, we're not gonna be the only tool doing that. Uh, you know, NOV and others have had the black box, you know, uh, Frank's has their, their really cool high resolution data logger now. Uh, there are all sorts of tools out there that they're joining dynamics tools, et cetera. The, the downhole memory densities are increasing and increasing. The shock and vibe sensors and the rotation sensors and the gyros are getting better and better. I mean, we're gonna be looking at a future where we're not too long from now, we might have 10 gigabytes of downhole data to process per downhole run and extract information from and apply to all the tools. And so obviously you can tell right. this is, this is a, a part of the conversation that I'm ex extremely excited about, right? 
but there is there is yeah. so much left on the table right now. So that leads me to section number three, and the final section before we go to Q and A um, is the longer term uh, technology. So this is 2022 and beyond. Um, these are things that we're going to be needing to deal with, and you began to hit on one already, um, which is bigger data, right? Two gigs, ten gigs, whatever it might be. Um, people are going to get quite used to having that luxury downhole. We're going to be collecting more data. There's going to be all this data on the surface. Now what, right? That's the question. So what the heck do we need to do to start um, getting technology going so that when all this data uh, gets to us at the surface, we actually know what the heck to do with it? Uh, yeah, I, I have definitely been part of a project that thought all the work was in building the data collection system and then deploying that to the field and then getting the data back, right? And like, I can't tell you how silly I felt when like, you know, the run data starts coming in and it all gets being, you know, pushed up to the cloud drive and there's gigabytes of data accumulating and you go, well, now what do I do? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to manually do this. Um, and, 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 and honestly, look, if you're, if you're downhole products, like no matter what they are or service products or whatever, if you're not backing that up with just a ton of data for future design or iteration of those products, you are not going to be competitive going forward. Like that is going to be the new way of working, right? So, you know, in the past, it was always build a prototype, you know, uh, you know, put it out of the field, learn what you can from it, you know, make a whole bunch, sell them, you're doing good, okay, right? Like we've now added a new step to that for every single process, which is just build the product, put the prototypes out in the field, start collecting the data, use machine learning, use data engineers, use data scientists to analyze the data, improve the product that way, right? Like that, if you're not having that step in your product development, you're not gonna remain competitive in this market or any market in my opinion. And no matter what your product is, even if it's a damn O-ring or something. And um, and so you really have to be, think about what, ah. You really have to think about what you're gonna do with that data well ahead of time, right? And, and you know, you're gonna have to realize that you're probably gonna have to hire, you know, hand, handfuls of full-time people to write programs, to view the data and analyze it, to run machine learning analytics on it, to try and discover the models that are within that data. I mean, there is just so much, you know, that nobody's come out with a, a generic, um, uh, here's your magic AI that helps you design your product better by looking at all your data products and just, you know, you just install and, and run, right? And whoever does that first is gonna be a trillionaire, right? But that might be a little ways off, you know, right before the singularity or something. And so um, that's just that's just a, a massively critical critical part of it to, to have this data collection influence your product design. Yeah, uh, I mean, we threw out just a tiny little piece of technology, Wave. Um, that's free. Anyone can download it. Um, all you need is an email. Uh, but yeah, that's our first step at at least helping you guys not have to jump into Excel to massage this data. You can throw in all your data sources off of a run and graph it there. So it's like probably the wave would be like step one of getting out of Excel. And then you have like these other building blocks that Ken's talking about uh, to actually apply algorithms and, and what do they call it? Data analytics um, to actually finding out what the heck to do with it once you've done that. Yeah. I'm going to do a little pop culture here, reference South Park and go, step one, load your data and wave and look at it. Step two, step three, profit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it, it, it's difficult. It is specific to every single, uh, you know, uh, product, right? You have to really like figure out what's important about your product that you need to extract from that data because the data can tell you so much and it can honestly misdirect you if you're not careful as well. Right. Um, an, a question that we have here is, um, will there be an independent market gyro? Oh man, your camera's falling. I'm really again. sorry. I, I'm actually, okay. All right. I think I'm good. My, there we go. Okay. My, my computer is about to run out of power. Um, yes. So, I mean, uh, you know, the MIM sensors were transformational for, you know, magnetic directional sensors and, uh, MIMS is just the absolute, you know, future for pretty much any sensor technology. I mean, there's still a lot of really cool applications for mechanical or hand built or, you know, quartz sensors or whatever else, but so much more of the innovation is coming from the MIMS side of things. And a lot of the manufacturers that were building those things by hand are now switching to MIMS. And um, so uh, gyros are a big push, obviously not just for oil and gas down hole. There's all sorts of de defense, UAV, um, you know, applications where, you know, having a really tiny, really accurate, minimized 
gyro is going to be really important, right? And so I think the barrier to entry for uh, smaller groups building gyro systems and bringing them to market is absolutely going to continue to come down. There's going to be a lot of really great parts to uh, to, to use to bring your, your inventions to market, right? And so I see GWD becoming, you know, much more uh, proliferant in the market and having a lot more and being able to, to start buying them, right? Because right now you still have to rent them from whoever has it. And I mean, I'll, you know, GWD sensors are way harder to build than magnetic sensors, but they're going to get easier and easier. And there's going to be more groups that have a, a chance to build those. Yeah, uh, I mean, I 100% agree. Um, th there's actually a comment here in the, in the chat um, that we're focusing on upstream, but we never know how this technology might be able to be reapplied for midstream and downstream and other markets. And, and that kind of leads me to my next topic, which is um, right now we've been focusing on upstream MWD, right? But people use MWD for um, mining. We use it for HDD. Um, but one of the hotter topics, <laughs> I swear I'm not trying to be punished, <laughs> um, <laughs> is uh, geothermal. So that like over the last 12 months, a lot of buzz about geothermal. Um, and maybe it was the Haynesville thing that brought us to think about that. But like, what's, what, what is that market supposed to be looking like? And, and I mean, how can we transpose our technology and maybe help geothermal gain some steam? <laughs> You know, it, there's, there's actually a really cool interaction of all these markets, right? And, and the HDD market is incredibly interesting. Um, those guys are driven by absolute precision, right? Like they have to have drilling accuracy down to the, to the inch because they, they actually exit the ground, right? And um, what's also awesome is, is we can learn a lot from them because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the big uh, things that, that we've been asked by operators recently is to, you know, pack the well bores tighter and tighter together, right? Like getting, getting instead of 30 foot or 40 foot spacing on, on your verticals down, down to where you start do, you know, building some separation, you know, building those at like 10 feet apart, right? And so the only way to really do that is magnetic ranging, right? At 10 feet apart, there is no drilling tool on the planet that can, through dead reckoning navigation, have a, a small enough error of uncertainty, you know, cone of uncertainty or whatever to where you're not at risk for colliding those wells. And the only way to do that is to really range to the other one actively or passively. And so, you know, the guys in the HDD market, I mean, they, they are ranging every day, right? Like we, we go out and we drill off the earth magnetic field most of the time and then only range when we have to, they have no choice. I mean, we're, when you're drilling, you know, uh, uh, next to, um, uh, you know, the, the, what is the stadium, the, the, the Oakland, the Raider stadium in, in Oakland, the Coliseum, right? Your magnetic field right. is garbage. Like it, there's just no choice, right? You have to create an artificial magnetic field and, and, and range to it. There's, there's just no chance of drilling off for earth magnetics, right? And so, um, you know, what you're going to see in the, in the, in the future here is uh, a really interesting parallel between, you know, uh, oil and gas NWD, HGD NWD, and then geothermal is really taking off as well. And so what is, um, what is really driving a lot of the conversations and excitement on, on geothermal is that people have figured out that we can build uh, what's called these loops in the ground, right? I, I assume that the word loop is really being brought in because of the hyperloop and Elon Musk kind of making the word loop cool again. Um, but, um, you know, there, there's companies like Evor and, and others, and I, I hope I'm saying that right. But um, they have, uh, you know, the old, I, I think the old school, and I really, I'm, I'm just learning geothermal, so I, I, I might get this wrong, but I think the old school approach was, you know, you, uh, you find a pretty hot formation, you, you really care about what, what's kind of down there, because what you're going to do is, is poke two holes, and one's going to be an injection, and one's going to be a, a return, and you're going to, you know, pump hot water, or pump, pump water, or whatever down in the, in the injection hole, have it move to the formation, get heated up, and then come back out the, the return hole. And so instead of doing that, instead of just pumping into an open reservoir now where we care about like the water table and what's down there, et cetera, people have decided, oh, you know what I can do? I can drill a vertical here. I can drill a vertical there. I can, I can build a curve. I can go across with a lateral and I can connect them with magnetic ranging, right? And so that's awesome because now we don't really care about, you know, what is in the ground. We don't care about the reservoir at all. Um, we don't care, uh, you know, really where we drill it. It's just a matter of how deep do we have to go to get hot enough for this to make sense. So it's all in totally enclosed system. And so I think there's a big, you know, wave in geothermal right now where people are, are, are figuring out they can build these closed loop geothermal systems, which really changes the nature of when and where and for who you can drill a geothermal well. And I think that's going to uh, result in a big boom of, of geothermal wells being driven, right? And so, um, you know, Geothermal, I mean, we are actually going to be a side benefit of people developing better geothermal tools because geothermal thermal 
uh, you know, temperature requirements are way hotter than any, any oil well requirement, right? So uh, the ask out of the gate on geo, the geothermal side is 300 degrees Celsius, right? And I, I think I saw one of the guys make a comment that, said that, that one of the majors had built a 300 degree C prototype NWD. I'd never really seen that. I'd love to see that. And um, ouch one. <laughs> he must have been referencing my uh, inability to stop making puns. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, Zach. Okay. You're so punny, Zach. Um, anyways, uh, and so that, that, that revolution in geothermal is really going to have an uptick, right? And so we're going to have uh, these three industries where uh, high temp tools and magnetic ranging are all going to become uh, a really big part of what everyone's required to go and do a job, right? And the other interesting thing about geothermal is the whole LWD stack is pretty useless. I mean, when all, when all I care about is getting to a temperature, all I need is a directional sensor in a, in a, in a you know, temperature sensor. I don't, I don't need a, you know, res tool. Like, what do I care, right? It's just rock. You know, I just need to work my way through it and get down to where it's hot enough and close a loop. And then there you go. You built a geothermal power plant using, you know, uh, high temperature NWD directional drilling magnetic ranging technologies, right? And so there's this whole very interesting industry that is, you know, up and coming and going to be expanding throughout the next 10 years that, Honestly, you know, pretty much any any directional drilling provider today could look at, you know, being part of that well construction, right? And so um, it's going to be a, a really interesting intersection of, of industries and technologies. And I, yeah, and I think, I, think I, I honestly think the independents are going to be better suited to serve it because, you know, really it's, it's, it's mostly been the majors that, that uh, have the resources to go and build these massive LWD stacks. And, and that's not going to be the competitive technology anymore. It's going to be, you know, magnetics and magnetic ranging, maybe a gyro. And so that's a much lower bar to field, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm excited about it because it's, you're, you're getting green energy, but we also get to use all those skills that we've built in our career in oil and gas. So, you, you know, it's not like algae or something where I have no business yeah. Yeah. in it, that it, industry. It, Carl, I, I saw that, I saw, I actually was, was there in, at the uh, SPE when they presented that paper. Uh, it was really interesting. They built that 300 degree system and they, they went through really cool techniques they used to build it. And then they went and drilled a geothermal well in Iceland and everyone is excited to see, okay, what's the downhole temperature? And the mud was so cold on surface that when they pumped it down, it cooled the tool to 125C. So it's like, okay, why do we need a 300 degree C tool for this particular well if the mud could cool it, right? And maybe- Maybe, hey, maybe, maybe that answers. Yeah, maybe we're screwing this up entirely and we should just be working on more more cost effective ways to cool the mud at surface right like maybe that's the better yeah. way to go right like stop screwing around with it and just condition condition your mud right but someone's gonna have to you know bust out the spreadsheet and say okay you know chilling the mud to this temperature versus building the tool what's the cost differential right i mean but i i love when you can attack a problem sideways like that as opposed to attacking it head on like if you really think outside the box and try and think of a better way to do it that, that can always be awesome yeah, and Ken, uh, it looks like we have eight minutes left, um, and we have one more topic and then Q&A, so um, oh, final good. topic here. Everybody keeps talking about going for true, personless, automated systems. What is it actually going to take for us to get to that reality? A lot more work in a business case, if I'm being cheeky, <laughs> right? Um, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, telling us that, hey, it really doesn't make sense for us to go manless because as soon as we do, it's a massive hit to our revenue and it's really not saving anything because, you know, the, the, the hit to the revenue is too much, right? Um, I also think there's a big difference between automated and remote because really what we want for these manless systems are automated systems, right? Not remote systems, you know, just having somebody do the same job from a remote center with TeamViewer or, or even some more specialized software is not really what we're looking for here. We're looking for a system that, you know, is entirely automated and redundant and can be put on a well site and you literally forget about it unless it sends you a message that says, hey, there's a problem here. The automation can't handle. Come pay attention to this job, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think that we've gotten really good at remote and the systems have gotten much better at remote, but I think there's still a long way to go to get automated. And, um, and so that's good. There's a, we have, we have a huge roadmap we're working on towards that. And it's going to be a lot of fun and a, a, a big difference. And you'll see all that kind of coming together in the eclipse system. Uh, but it's, it's still a lot, of, a lot more to go. Right. Um, well, I mean, it looks like we have five whole minutes left here. So, um, I'd like to open it to Q and a, there were some questions we skipped. If you've got questions on topics that we didn't hit already, uh, that you believe are big topics to talk about throw them in the chat and we can talk through them. There was one question, Ken, that we skipped earlier from 
Mike Cortez, um, what are the companies that can handle the hot hole uh, work right now in East Texas? Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, when we mostly heard about Sperry, Pro, Gordon, Total, and others kind of being very aggressive in that area, right? Um, that's a short list. I'm sure there's more. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out. Hopefully they're not going to get offend too mad at me, but those are companies that I know that are actively competing aggressively in the Haynesville, right? Um, yeah. Another way to say that is those are the people that we knew to be operating or working in the Haynesville before it was popular. Yeah. And so I mean, it's really going to be a, 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 a no holds, you know, bar, <laughs> barred bar, brawl out there. Right. So, um, Ilya had a question earlier about flasking and, you know, the, for the flasking is becoming more interesting again for, for high temperature stuff because, you know, the run times are really coming down, you know, back, at, back in the day we had two, 300 hour long, you know, 300 hours is a bit much, but you know, much longer run times. And the, the problem with the flask is it, it will eventually heat up, right? It is, a, it is a temporary solution. It's not a permanent solution. The flask is not a, an active cooling, but it's a, it's a barrier. And so if we're looking at shorter and shorter run times, then yeah, there's a chance that the flasking technology can be, I mean, not the whole solution, but part of the solution, right? Um, and so there's, there's, some, there's some interesting thoughts about looking, looking at the flasking market again uh, for, uh, for really extreme hot hole applications. Uh, maybe Mike, maybe, maybe you should talk to Zach after afterwards. This question is, do we have a gyro tool? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a short answer. I don't have a full gyro MWD tool. Um, we have a vertical, uh, gyro that we've worked with, uh, Clinton Moss at, uh, Gunner to develop, um, that we use for well interventions and things of that nature, but, uh, certainly not full gyro MWD just yet. Uh, no, I, I, I'm too late for the RSS game, Dougie. You know, uh, we're, we're going to watch that with excitement. And we also, you know, one of the things I also believe is that NBD and RSS systems are both really hard things to develop. And, and I th I, I'm kind of skeptical other than like through an acquisition of the best in breed NBD and the best in breed RSS kind of naturally evolving under the same roof, right? And so our, our perspective is we really want to play well and open with, with all the RSS systems out there because we want, really want to focus on our brain power on making the NWD the best that it can be. Um, and even going so far as like, we are very open and willing to having our NWD guts be put inside an RSS system, right? Because there's also an interesting case that like, why do they need to be separate systems? And it's much more related to politics and separate companies and separate billings than in separate responsibilities than it is a technical limitation. I mean, you really can't, it's not, it's not a large stretch technically to imagine an all-in-one system that has, you know, a, a, a RSS steering element, a directional sensor and some sort of pulser or EM transmitter on top. And so, uh, you know, there could be a really interesting overlay with integration between NBD and RSS systems in the near future for sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I much prefer for the NBD to be below below the motor. I know that puts much more on the motor, but it, it gets the, the 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 measurements closer to the bit. It gets the steering closer to the bit. All this kind of stuff, and um, uh, <clears throat> and it's it, to me, it's the overall overall better better way to run the system. I think there's more benefits than uh, you know um, uh, than than, than <clears throat> trade offs there when you're uh, really running. Um, you know, below the motor. It's, it's my favorite place to run. And it's funny, we, back in like 2014, we used to say, does it, will it even pulse below the motor? Do we even know if it'll pulse? Yeah, it pulse, right? You know, but well, the interesting thing is going to be, uh, you know, as people, people really start to discover that truly, yes, the positive pulse NWD actually does microstall your motor every single time it pulses, right? That's going to be an interesting, uh, you know, kind of studying that and, and getting around that, and et cetera. We've got uh, okay, two more Did questions here, Ken, in two minutes. Daniel says, what are the technical issues that need to be overcome in order for your 50% of jobs at 10 bits per second to become true? Um, uh, better filters and AI ML decoding at the surface, uh, compress the living crap out of everything, faster pulsers that can take more wear. It's got to be a whole stack to make that come true. It's not just one product or the other, right? Uh, and then you have another question. Do you have a 175C MWD from John? It's coming, John. Talk to Zach afterwards. <laughs> One more minute here, folks. 
I can elaborate on the MWD. The, we have uh, Eclipse coming out. That's one of our technology partners um, with uh, Black Diamond, Basin, Wenzel, if you've heard of them. Um, we're releasing a 175C MWD system. So keep an eye on LinkedIn. Um, there will be plenty of chatter on it. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. Yeah, <laughs> this, this was fun. I really appreciate everyone joining us, and I, I had a, a really, really good time today. So I hope you guys learned something and had a good time as well. So thanks, yeah. everyone. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, be sure to shoot us a message if we didn't get to your topic or we missed something or tell us what you liked, what you didn't like about the format. We'll improve for next time. Thanks, everyone.